This is the WGBH Forum Network. The title of my talk, I, I didn't come up with this title, and so it was really amazing reading it. <laughs> um, why high school graduates become college dropouts and what to do about it. I would love to know the answers to that question. <laughs> I hope that Bridget's going to give us some insight into it. Um, but it, this is an ambitious topic, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start today by turning it around and say, I think the challenge on the high school front is how do we turn the aspirations that kids are bringing to us into attainment? And I, I think it's probably one of the most important questions in education today. Now, um, there are a lot of people at this school that can start on pieces of this problem, and I think the more people we have working on it, the better. Uh, I'm going to talk about it from the high school perspective. All of my work are in high schools, and so I think um, what I'm going to try to do is talk it from, from the high school perspective, and I hope that Bridget will come up and talk about it from the college perspective. Um, and I'm going to talk about a little piece of the problem, and I'm going to talk about a little piece of the world, Chicago. Okay, it's not a little piece of the world. This is a very large piece of the world. Um, but I, I want to be really clear that all of the things I'm talking about is from an urban school perspective perspective. Um, and I think the issues are quite different, and I, and I hope that we'll get Ron to say some things about the things he's wo learned working in suburban school systems. I think urban schools are in, in a very different place and in a very different perspective. Uh, and, I, and, and, and I think that, that it's important to put it in context. But, so why would somebody who cares about high school and who spends all of her time thinking about how to reform high school start working on college? Well, the answer is, is if you walk into any urban high school right now and sit down with parents and kids and ask, what do you want to get out of high school? There's only one answer I've heard. Graduate, go to college. Graduate, go to college. Graduate, go to college. In fact, it took me a while in the last couple of years to realize the extent of the change we've seen. So think about this for a minute. From 1980 to 2002, the percentage of kids nationally who wanted to complete a, high, a bachelor's degree or higher went from 40 to 80 percent, or 40 to 79 percent. Among low-income kids, look at this. I was the 1980. I graduated from high school in 1979. And that was about right. Actually, the high school I went to, we were only about 10 percent of us went to college. But about 19 percent of low-income kids say they wanted to complete a four-year degree. We're now up to 66%. Last year in Chicago, I surveyed kids in the Chicago Public Schools, and 80% of seniors said they wanted a four-year college degree, and an additional 14% said they wanted to attain a two-year degree. This is so dramatically new. Now we, you know, now we all know it's generating this. One of my research assistants who uh, has a, a, a real f sense of phrase came in one day, and she was standing there, and she said, I feel so stupid. And I said, why? And she said, you know, what I remember when I first got to graduate school, sitting in my first policy course, feeling like I was really discovering something new about the changing economy and the widening of the American income distribution and increasing returns to education and how if you don't graduate, go to college, your earnings are going to fall. And there's not a kid in our study that needs to go to graduate school to know that. They're living it. They're bringing it into every single interview. It's driving their ambition. So from the perspective of high schools, this seems like a really good place to start in high school reform. If this is what students are bringing to us, then what we should do is try to change those aspirations to attainment. And as Bridget will probably tell you, one of the things we're seeing is that increasing numbers of kids are not only aspiring to college, but they're going to college. The problem is, is they're not completing college. And this problem is even worse in urban areas when we consider the dropout rate. So one of the things that we've been doing at the consortium is uh, connecting our studies. So I've just started a transition to college study, and I'll show you data from what we're finding about the transition to college. It didn't take long to realize, well, we just completed a dropout report. Why don't we put them together? So let me show you the numbers. There's lots of data, but no. no. Of, of kids in the Chicago public schools who walk in of 13-year-olds, only 54% of 13-year-olds make it to graduation by age 19. 
You have the 54% number? You'll see in a minute that we see that about a third of kids, 34%, are making the transition to a four-year college within the year after graduation. 54% times 34% is 18.6%. You'll also see today that of students who walk in, out of Chicago public schools, not the same cohort, going back to an earlier cohort, of the kids who graduated earlier in 1989, who we just studied, only 35% of those attending four-year colleges man managed to graduate within six years. So what does this mean? This means that of the 80% of freshmen who walk into Chicago public schools and hope to complete a four-year degree, we would expect that about 6.5%, unless something changes dramatically, will be able to attain a college degree by their mid-20s. For African-American males and Latino males, those numbers are 2.5 and 3%. This particular graphic landed me on the front page of the Sun-Times last week with the word appalling. And it's not meant to shock and awe for you. I'm from Chicago, but I'm, I'm, I live in Chicago now, but I'm really from Massachusetts, so uh, you'll have to excuse the accent. <laughs> Everyone kept saying when the new press conference, don't say GPA, say cost performance. Now, how is anyone going to understand me saying cost performance? <laughs> it's like say, me saying art. Um, okay, so looking at this number, do people understand this number? This is not meant to shock and awe. What it is meant to do is give us a roadmap for high school reform. Because if our job is to figure out how to tra translate aspirations into attainment, it's pretty easy what we got to do, right? We got to get them to graduate, then we got to get them to college, and then we got to get make sure that they get there when they graduate. They're going to get the skills to do well once there. We got to attack each one of these bubbles. That's the marching orders. Now, I want to start talking about college by talking about dropping out. I'm going to start talking about that first bubble, because I think it's related to the problem we're facing. So let me talk, talk about dropping out first. First, while dropping out is a complex problem, in the end, the bulk of the problem is that kids drop out of high school because they fail courses. Ultimately, they fail so many courses, they fall so far behind, they simply can't make it. And they decide that they have to leave and try another angle. Almost nobody drops out, they try another angle, or they stop out for a while. Indeed, I would argue that dropping out today is most often a process centered around academic failure, with students having the aspirations but not the skills or supports to manage high school. They begin having difficulty, fall farther and farther behind, and finally leave. And the epicenter of this problem happens in the transition to high school as kids struggle with meeting the academic and social demands of the transition. Addressing dropout rates, then, takes a two-tier approach. We've got to increase student skills before they get there, and we've got to work on the transition to make sure that kids have the structures and academic supports to transition successfully once they're there. Let me highlight the, transition, the importance of the transition, the ninth grade transition, because it's something that I think is also critically linked to the college transition problem, and it's one of the most important things we can talk about in high school reform. What we know is that working on entering skills, if every high school principal I know has one solution to drop out, send me better kids. My response is, we now know enough about the transition to high school that if Working on sending you better kids without working on ninth grade is not going to solve the problem. I think this graph vividly shows this. This is a, the, a measure that we've been using at the consortium by on track freshman year. A student is on track at the end of freshman year if they have enough credits and no failures in a major subject so that they can move to 10th grade status. It's a little complicated, but let me take a minute on it. First, of all freshmen in the Chicago public schools, only 58% of kids walk into Chicago public schools and are on track by the end of ninth grade. Of students who are on track, 81% graduate. Of students who are off track, 22% graduated four years later. Most importantly, this is independent of achievement. 
Chicago public school elementary schools have, have really improved so much so that the average eighth grader entering Chicago, it's not, uh, leaving eighth grade in Chicago is reading at or above grade level on national norms. So our third quartile are kids who are reading at or above grade level on national norms. Of kids that walk into high school with average to above average achievement, third quartile, 35%, one, over one third were off track at the end of freshman year. The off track kids who, who were off track, only 26% of them graduated. On track, 82% graduated. This doesn't mean that achievement doesn't matter, but if you look across the bars, that's the effect of achievement on graduation. You look between the bars, that's the effect of being on or off track. In fact, we can control for entering achievement, we can control for attendance. Kids are on track freshman year are more than three and a half times more likely to graduate later on. Now, on, we can fix this. This is a fixable phenomenon. Now, kids will figure this out pretty soon. In fact, what I argue is that in schools with high dropout rates, when you go into one of these schools, most students really quickly figure out the strategy for graduation. If I ask most of my kids, how do you graduate from high school, they say, go to class, pass your classes. Go to class, pass your classes. And that works. It gets you to graduation. Passing your courses gets you to graduation. But most first-generation college students are then struggling with the strategies that they're going to need to get to college. And unless somebody gets them their strategies, they're going to use that strategy. Go to class, pass your courses. The central problem that we're facing right now in Chicago is that high schools are not turning survival into performance. And we're not moving kids towards the strategies and achievement they'll need for college. In essence, I would argue that working on college, working on dropouts means getting kids to be able to handle high school and do high school level work and transition successfully. Working on college means that we actually do something in high school between freshman and senior year. So let me turn to the college problem. Last week, we released our new study on the transition to college among Chicago students. Let me set up the, pro the uh, study a little bit. It's called From High School to the Future and talk about what we find. Uh, two years ago, in uh, a partnership with the Chicago Public Schools, we started tracking all of Chicago Public School students into college using data from the National Student Clearinghouse. Uh, which is a college tracking system that allows us to identify about 91% of college enrollment in the U.S. Uh, coverage in Illinois is substantially higher because a very high proportion of Illinois colleges participate in the NSC, and unfortunately, uh, very few Chicago ki kids leave Illinois for college. So we estimate that we miss about 5% of enrollment using NSC data. The data I'm going to show you on, on graduates I did limited, are graduates who are not in special education and not enrolled in alternative high schools. I'm going to emphasize that again. And the reason I did not have special education in this report was I'm not sure yet how to analyze grades and high school performance for special ed kids as they go to college. But when you look at the data on African American males, we have to remember that 20% of African American graduates in Chicago public schools are not in this data set because they are in special education. I'm looking primarily at college enrollment by the spring after graduation, so the full year, not just the immediate transition. And I'm looking at the graduating classes of 2002 and 2003 for college enrollment and then a much earlier class, the 1980-99 class for uh, college completion because we needed six years. All right. I'm going to show you a lot of data really fast because Ron said I have to go to 620. And so let me tell you the punchline. The punchline is CPS students are going to college. They're aspiring and they're going, pretty much like the kids nationally. But they're concentrated in two-year and non-selective four-year colleges. Much of this is explained by low levels of preparation, particularly very poor grade point averages are limiting access to four-year and selective colleges for kids. And when they enroll in four-year colleges, they're not graduating at very high rates, largely because of preparation and, as you'll see, because of very poor college choice or uh, because of uh, 
uh, poor quality in the college sector. This is the participation rates of African uh, of, of uh, Chicago public school students by the full year afterwards for the 2002-2003 graduating class. So we identify about 59% of our kids as enrolled in college. We had a great lunchtime conversation where I showed to people that this is pretty similar to national rates. 64% of African Americans and 50% of Latinos, females. What you notice, I want you to notice two things. One, we see really quite significant variation in race and ethnicity in our college enrollment rates. Much of this, it's a really cool graph for this reason, much of this is because of enrollment in four-year colleges. All of the differences across race and gender are largely caused by the difference in the four-year college enrollment, that top line, not two-year college enrollment. And so a lot of the focus I'm going to talk about today is how do we get kids into four-year colleges? How do we break the four-year college act barrier? We also see quite significant differences by gender. When we look clo more closely at these college attendance patterns, and I, I was talking to somebody after the lecture today, it's pretty similar for Boston, what we see is what we call very tight feeder relationships. When CPS students are going to college, over 53% of kids are going to 10 colleges. You look at those colleges, and I, I always have to do this, and one of the reasons I put this in here was to remind myself to do this. Harvard is not a selective college. It's a very or most selective college. When we talk about selective colleges in this data set, we're talking about the University of Illinois at Chicago, DePaul, Loyola. These are the big ones in Chicago. When we're talking about non-selective colleges, we're largely talking about the bottom tier of the public universities that basically have open enrollment. And when I'm talking about somewhat selective colleges, I'm largely talking about the large state universities, not the top tier. So in Illinois, you think I should do this for Massachusetts, but I actually can't because of all the changes in the UMass system. So in Illinois, our bottom tier colleges are non-selective public universities. Most of our large public universities, like um, Northern Illinois, are, would be characterized as somewhat selective. The University of Illinois at Chicago is selective, and then our top tier university, Urbana-Champaign, is highly selective. This concentration, combined with the fact that very few kids leave Chicago for college, there's many, we can talk about this graph, but there ain't much to talk about. Nobody's leaving Chicago means that when we group kids by the kinds of colleges they go to, we find that most students in Chicago are concentrated in two-year and non-selective colleges. In fact, only 27% of CPS graduates who attend college go to selective or very selective schools. So should I care? Or in college is college. What's the matter with worrying about where they're going? Well, there's two questions that lead me to look at preparation. Latino kids are going at lower rates. Boys are going at lower rates than girls, particularly in two-year colleges. Should I be, are these kids making different choices or are they facing different options? That's what leads you to preparation, right? What I want to know is, is this the options they have or are these the choices they're making? The second issue is, I, 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 are, they, are students concentrating in these local colleges because, again, these are their choices or these are their only options? And particularly, should I be concerned about local colleges if their graduation rates are fine? If they were going to colleges where they had very high graduation rates, I'd be, feel fine. But if they are graduating with only access to a couple of institutions and those institutions are not doing well by those kids, then I better worry about it. So let me talk about qualifications. In this report, I look at three measures of qualifications. The third one I'm not going to talk about that much because it, the analysis isn't as rigorous as I want it to be. First, ACT scores. Remember, they have this, we're in the Northeast, and we have the SAT here. In the Midwest, we have the ACT. Um, while the, every 10th grader in Boston takes the MCAS, uh, Illinois made a great decision to not mount its own test and every junior in Illinois takes the ACT. 
So I'm looking at ACT scores for all juniors in Illinois, not just kids who decide to take the test. Second is unweighted grade point average, which I unweighted because, as you'll see, um, in order to make grade point averages comparable across schools and across achievement level uh, and across um, cost-taking patterns. So kids who take AP and honors courses, they get extra boosts for grades, right? So I don't know if those kids do better in those courses and they get higher grades or if it's just the boost. So we went through in a painstaking process and unweighted every GPA in the Chicago Public Schools um, uh, and, and so looked at an unweighted GPA in major subjects. Okay. This I don't mind calling abysmal. This is the average ACT scores of kids in the Chicago Public Schools. The average CPS ACT score is 17.1, which as you can see is significantly below the national average of about 21. Now the national average is not a direct comparison because nationally only kids who want to go to college are taking the ACT, so that's not a direct comparison. But the Illinois average in which all juniors take the ACT is 20.2. Most problematic is we have 36% of kids are scoring below a 15 on the ACT, and an additional 29% are scoring between a 15 and a 17. I didn't take these off. One of my graduates, one of my project directors, decided to go crazy with these boxes, but I think these work. Okay. When we look across race and gender, I've got a little boxes popping up very soon here. We see that Asian and white and other ethnic students in the Chicago Public Schools, um, not only are they, can you see the bottom? Not only are they above the Illinois average, but fully almost a quarter of Asian students and over 20% of, of white students, uh, white and other ethnic students, we have a lot of immigrant groups in Chicago, so white becomes sort of a catch-all phrase, um, are scoring uh, above a 24 on the ACT. On the other end, however, we see very few African-American and Latino students, so much so that I couldn't even put the numbers up there, scoring higher on the ACT. And we see almost over 40% of African-Americans and over a third of Latinos scoring below a 15 on the ACT. This is just abysmal test performance. Equally as abysmal, and perhaps more important in my mind, are students' grades. 35% of seniors in the Chicago Public Schools are leaving high school with less than a 2.0 GPA in their major subjects. That is a D average. An additional 24% are leaving between a 21 point and a 20, uh, 2.1 and 2.5. I have to go back. I just realized I forgot something. What you notice here is that there are no gender differences in ACT performance in Chicago. So I cannot explain the lower college enrollment patterns of boys, particularly African-American Latino boys, by their ACT. I can't even explain them by entering test scores, because as you saw, we like, uh, we, well, only about 38% of black males are making it to graduation in Chicago public schools. You know, the guys that make it, they're a pretty good bunch. When I take those guys and I track them back to eighth grade, they're entering test scores in eighth grade, are equivalent or higher to, than the girls. So as I pretty much weeded out a lot of kids. We're not seeing an ACT performance, but let's look at grades. First, among Asian students in the Chicago Public Schools, which is not a big group, but I wanted to get over there so you could see it, <laughs> Fully 29% of Asian females are graduating high school with greater than a 3.5 GPA. Look at the gender gap. Very few African American and Latino students are graduating with high GPAs, but most importantly, over half of African American males are walking out of high school in Chicago public schools with less than a 2.0 GPA. So let me say it again. Only 38% of African American males in Chicago public schools graduate from high school by age 19. Of the guys that make it and survive, 
over half have less than a 2.0 GPA, and over 75% have less than a 2.5 GPA. And as I just showed you, you can't blame it on test scores. It's not that much different for Latino kids. I think she went a little wacky on this. Now, let's get our brain wrapped around grades because grades are critically important here for, for this story. I think it is largely an urban myth that what we're doing in urban schools is handing out GPAs, right? Because if these guys, if these test scores are overinflated, we got big problems. In fact, I love, there is an urban myth that there is kids graduating in the top 10% of urban schools and they graduate with 4.0 GPAs, they're in the top of their class, they think they're so smart and they enter college and they find out that their test scores were right and they don't have the skills to make it in college. This is almost the smallest group possible in the Chicago public schools. Generally what you find is that GPAs and ACTs are going together here. Kids with low GPAs have low ACT scores. Kids with high GPAs there's a very small group with high ACT scores and low GPAs. I think they're all professors' kids. And there's a very, very small group with high GPAs and low, low ACT scores. In fact, if I take those two together, that's 2% of all graduates. Most importantly, what we find is that it is very, very hard to get high GPAs in a low-performing school. This is a graph of ACT scores by GPA for, for Chicago public school students. What you see is that most high schools in the city are not graduating students with, with GPAs. In fact, this is just, just look at this for a minute. This means the average, these are the average test scores. The average test scores in these schools are below a 17 for seniors, and the average graduates have below a 2.4 GPA. In fact, it is only in the highest performing magnet schools in the city, and these are unweighted GPAs, that we're seeing students graduating with the kinds of grades, as I'll tell you in a minute, that they're going to need for college. Now, what we then did was say, well, does this matter? You know, kids have terrible ACT scores. Kids have terrible GPAs. Does it matter? So we did an analysis of how ACP, GPAs and ACTs shape the probability of going to college, shape the probability of going to a two- or four-year college, the four-year college barrier, and shape the probability of going to a selective college. And so I'm going to do this quickly so I can go to the college stuff, but let me just tell you the punchlines. Turns out that, that low ACTs in particular are not a significant barrier to going to college. Uh, Jim Rosenbaum wrote a book, Beyond College for All, that argues that the open enrollment in two-year colleges have had a really de deleterious effect on high school performance because every kid knows that it doesn't matter, you can go to college. Well, this is largely true. But they are a significant barrier to enrollment in four-year colleges. So this is, the blue line is how the probability of enrolling in college varies. This is controlling for GPA by students' ACT scores. This is a pretty flat line, right? In Chicago, you have 52% of kids with ACT scores of 10. I'm trying to figure out how you get an ACT score of 10. Technically, in the technical manual, that's not the minimum score. <laughs> You know how you get 200, 200 points writing it in the SAT? That, supposedly the minimum is like a 12, but it, I don't know. So 52% of ACT scores with 10 go to college, and 68% of ACT scores with 25. This is not a really significant relationship in the probability of going to college. It's not a particular barrier. GPA is, however, if you look at kids with very low GPAs versus high GPAs, kids with low GPAs are, are going to say college is not for me, despite the aspirations. But as you can see, both ACT and GPA is really a significant barrier to enrolling in a four-year college, and particularly a selective four-year college. Kids with low ACT scores, particularly below 18, which you saw is the vast majority of Chicago public schools, are not very likely to get into a selective college with a low ACT score. We took this and combined this in an analysis that said, what, 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 given what we see in the patterns of college enrollment for CPS students, 
what kind of colleges they go to with certain GPA and ACT. What kind of choices did kids face? What we see, I want to go back for a second, excuse me, is that school, students with ACT higher than 18, 18 and GPAs higher than 2.4 were much more likely to attend four-year college. So when you do a bunch of interaction terms, that sort of becomes the four-year college mark. And we put together some analysis that said, what kind of kids, what kind of um, schools would you have access to given your ACT and GPA? Now, this is a very low threshold because I'm using it on the basis of what kind of stu schools CPS students are going to, and CPS students tend to be lower on average in their entering test scores and grades. But even with that low threshold, only 31% of Chicago public schools students graduate with GPAs and ACT scores that give them access to anything but a two-year college. Almost half of kids are concentrated in non-selective and two-year colleges. So my answer to the question, is this the choices they face, or is it the choices they make, is this is the choices they face. Despite their aspirations, students are not leaving Chicago public schools with the GPAs and ACT scores that get them access to the four-year colleges, and particularly to more selective four-year colleges. For boys, the prospects are abysmal. Indeed, almost 75% of African-American males have such low GPAs and ACT scores that they would only have access to two-year and non-selective colleges. I'm going to go th quickly through this. Okay. Now, if you're graduating with these low ACT scores and low GPAs, what's the prospect of doing well once there? I'm going to show you an analysis of what happens to our students from a previous cohort when they went to college. Now, I, talked, I said that our students are going to college at rates comparable to the nation, national data, but they are not graduating from college at rates not comparable to national data. When we look at CPS students in four-year colleges, only 35% manage to graduate within six years. Using the descriptive sum summary of the beginning post-secondary students, the comparable national number would be 64%, among African Americans, 46%, and among Latinos, 47%. So even compared to African American and Latino rates nationally, CPS students seem to be doing very poorly in college. Particularly, you think I've got a theme here going, particularly for African American and Latino graduates, and particularly for boys. In fact, only 22, we saw a very small proportion of African-American men in four-year colleges, only 22% managed to graduate from four years. Why? Well, let me say two things. Grades. Somebody asked me last week at a press conference, so if you had to tell a principal something, what would it be? It was the end of the press conference, okay? I was a little tired. And it was a friend of mine who asked the question. So I let my guard down and I said, Oh, it's an easy answer. Grades, 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 and college choice. So you can imagine what quote got played on all the radio. When we look at what matters in predicting college, and there's nothing new about this, there's a large uh, analysis of what predicts college graduation, and across the board, GPA is what matters most. You see that if I don't control for other measures, course performance looks like it makes a major difference. A half point increase in high school GPA is associated with as much as a 20% increase in graduation rates. If I control for your coursework in high school, the kind of classes you took, whether you took AP and honors classes, and I control for your test scores, that effect goes down a little bit, but not that much. In fact, I can control for almost all of the effect of test, score, uh, of test scores, half of the effect of test scores, and all of the effect of coursework by the grades that kids entered college with. Just another look at GPA. This is the graduation rates of CPS students in four-year colleges by the GPA they entered from high school with. Only 43% of students who walked in with a 3.0 GVA, a very small proportion of Chicago public school students managed to graduate in six years. It was only students who walked in with GPAs higher than 3.5 that managed to do well in their college classes. Now this should not make be rocket science, right? 
If you, how are you going to be able to do well in college if you haven't done well in high school? But I think we need to change the conversation of what we mean by well. But don't you think these rates are even low? I mean, if you studied hard in high school and you walked out with a 4.0 GPA and you only had a 63% chance of graduating from college in six years, I mean, this, just doesn't, this is just not good enough. So we started looking at college choice. These are the major colleges that, uh, I don't have to do this. College choice matters, and let me show you why. I'm just not going to do anything fancy. Let me just go to this. Trust that I've done lots of regression analyses, and I can't explain the fact that the colleges that our students are going to in Chicago have significantly lower college graduation rates. This is the likelihood of graduating from a college within six years for popular colleges in Chicago by student's GPA. Three major takeaways, and then I'm going to do one more graph. If you go into college with a 2.0 GPA out of high school, 50% of African American boys, your likelihood of graduating is very small no matter what college you go to. Does this make sense? Even within colleges, GPA matters a significant... Look at the line. Let me just sort of do my Loyola example because there's a couple of kids in my neighborhood that are going to Loyola and I have been torturing them with this graph. Of students in the same cohort in the same year who walked into Loyola with a 3.0 GPA from high school, 50% graduated within six years. The students that walked in with a 4.0 GPA, 87% graduated within six years. So that little bit of studying, a little more extra work, <laughs> keep it on task, and actually taking classes in which you do homework, buys you a significant amount. Third, college choice seems to matter the most for our best prepared students. This is a really significant finding. Because you would think that, and I think our, most of our high schools think, that you don't have to worry about these kids, they'll do well anywhere. But if you walked out of Chicago Public Schools with a 4.0 and you went to Loyola or the University of Illinois, um, or, or, I mean, or Northwestern, you have very high graduation rates. If you end up going to my bottom tier schools, you have extremely low graduation rates. Obviously, this is going to be a really significant piece of our research moving forward, trying to understand these differences in graduation rates. But what we find is, even after we control for measures of poverty in the neighborhood, even if we control for the high school you attended, your GPA, your ACT score, um, uh, the coursework you took, we cannot explain the significantly lower graduation rates of what we call our most popular six in Chicago. Even after adjusting for background of kids, kids who go in-state not one of the most popular six have, have graduation rates 46 versus 26, and if they go out of state, they have the highest graduation rates. Now, obviously, kids who are going out of state may be going to special programs, may be going particularly to HBCUs, may be going to places where they're getting much more support. But it is very clear to us, and you can imagine that the colleges in Chicago are not really happy with me right now, um, but it is very clear to us that simply looking, controlling for, for the kinds of kids that different colleges are getting cannot explain wide variation in college graduation rates. So let me end with what we know so far. So my answer to the question, <laughs> and I have to read this because it's important. How do we turn college aspirations into college performance? In the end, I come out uh, at the place that William Bowen and their colleagues did in Equity and Excellence, it's all about increasing levels of preparation before, and largely it is about high school reform. Most importantly, I hope I've made this point clear, solving this problem is not about test scores, and short-term solutions will not help. We're waiting to senior year is completely a waste of time. It is about kids being minimally engaged in high school work, working hard throughout high school, and making sure they're challenged to excel, to excel. It's largely about their grades. What we know is that grades matter. 
Low GPA is not just that kids are barely passing their courses. It means they are minimally engaged in coursework in ways that demonstrate that they're mastering material. Getting kids to graduate is easy. It's F's to D's. Getting kids to college means moving them to B's and A's, which means moving them to being deeply enough engaged in work that they are learning skills and critical study skills. So that's what I think what we know about my, my, my piece of this project, and I'll turn it over to a bigger expert. But let me tell you my biggest expert. Last fall, I interviewed one of my favorite kids in this study. I have all my favorite kids, but I'm particularly in love with this kid. He's an African-American male who is a really talented athlete. And in the middle of the interview last fall, he came into my interview and he said, you know, I am so glad I'm, I'm part of this study because things have been bothering me. And I, I was really taken up back by this because things had been going so good for him. <laughs> he had gotten a scholarship. He had gotten uh, a track scholarship. He had gotten admitted to a college. Everything was really great. So what could be bothering him? So I said, well, Sean, what, what's bothering you? And he said, well, you know, I'm a senior, and I, I'm really set. I've got good, my grades are up, because now I'm eligible. This is the sort of lingo for getting your ACT scores and your GPAs up enough so you can be eligible for a scholarship. And, I had, and I've had my GPA up, and all of my friends are going through the cracks, and they're falling apart because they weren't on the track team, so no one told them to keep their GPAs up, and now they're graduating, and they're graduating with these terrible grades, and they're not getting into college, and they don't know what to do, and this is, this is really bothering me. Well, my first thought was, I love this kid. My second thought was, think about this. These are the guys that survived in the system, and they are now no closer to their dream than they were four years ago when they started high school. I think that's a challenge. And I think Sean put it right. It is about how we begin to focus on the future of the kids in high school reform as we move forward. So thanks. Good evening. Um, let me see if I can switch these. Welcome again, first of all. It's wonderful to follow uh, Melissa. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say today really um, emphasizes the conclusions that you've come to in terms of what's going on in high schools, the transition to college. It's actually also interesting, you're, you being from Massachusetts studying Illinois, I'm from Chicago studying Massachusetts, and um, it was interesting to see things like NIU and U of I and all those other acronyms I'm used to from the Midwest, um, as well as, as the ACT. Um, so I'm going to take some time now, um, hopefully not too long, to leave time for questions, to think about what's happening to students once they leave high school. Thinking further along down the pipeline, what are colleges doing as they're trying to help students make that bridge from high schools uh, to college? Um, so there's really three things I want to talk about briefly. Are students prepared? And I'm going to take a broader stance looking at some national data, which will just put in perspective what's going on in Chicago. This is not uh, a limited example. Second, are they persisting in college? And I'll talk a little bit about some work I've done on another Midwestern uh, context in Ohio. And finally, um, well, what are some of the methods that colleges are using to try to help students who are reaching their doors and aren't adequately prepared uh, for um, college-level materials? So I'll talk briefly about remediation. So in terms of high school graduation and preparation, um, I believe Melissa quoted that the high school graduation rate in Chicago is 54%. If you're going to look at national data, including all of those great uh, suburban high schools and, and private high schools and so forth, there's some data that comes out and says, best case scenario, 71% nationally. Um, now this 
means only 7 out of 10. Think about the 30% that we're already losing at just getting to high school graduation. And there are huge disparities by race. Only 56% of African Americans are graduating, 52% of Hispanic or Latino students. You know, this is, if we, if we uh, see who is present in 8th grade and then track them all the way to 12th grade, so this is really capturing graduation rates rather than just saying, okay, who made it to 11th grade and do they graduate in 12th grade? There's, you'll see some disparities between what the high school are reporting versus what's actually happening. And when we think about, okay, so we are graduating seven, 7 out of 10, but how many are actually prepared for college? And according to this analysis from Green and Winters, it's really, really only about a third. So getting them to high school graduation is not enough, um, as Melissa definitely emphasized in her report. Switching to Ohio, uh, which some of my analysis will focus upon, uh, they did a study also using the ACT. Um, not everyone in Ohio is required to take the ACT, but of those students, they took a look to see whether or not they had taken an academic core, uh, meaning so many years of English, so many years of math, and so forth. And they only found, um, they found about two-thirds meet the requirements of meeting this core, so there's another one-third, or 36 percent, who aren't taking those courses. And it differs tremendously by K through 12 system, whether you're in an urban district versus a rural district, um, suburban and so forth. And thinking about Ohio, when you think about the large urban areas, we're talking about Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Akron, um, you have a lot of large urban schools that are, aren't doing very well. Also keep in mind, these numbers are probably inflated. This, these are self-reported numbers on the ACT, and it's likely that a student's going to say that they completed courses that maybe they haven't. Um, and if we were to look at the students who never end up taking the ACT, you can imagine that this would be even greater. But what really is college preparation? And what kind of signals do we give to students when they're in high school? Oftentimes we'll define the academic core, and they did in this study, and if you think about high school graduation requirements, we do say things like take four years of English, three years math, three years science, three years social studies, but is this really sufficient guidance? Students could get away with you know, four, three years of mathematics if they're taking Algebra two three years in a row, um, and then that would count for graduation requirements. We don't have a discussion in terms of what is accurate adequate preparation for college in terms of competencies that you should be reaching, courses that you should be reaching. And if you go to a lot of the state websites um, to try to drill down on what do you need to have in order to graduate from high school, you'll see more of these kinds of descriptions rather than being able to complete certain tasks or having certain skills. So question, is this really sufficient guidance? Um, barring from the work of the Stanford Bridge Project, where they did a, a large analysis talking about the disconnect between high schools and college, for example, many students believe that if they meet those high school requirements, they'll be ready for college, and that's just not true. That's not adequate preparation. Uh, they think if they're going to go to a community college, then they don't have to worry about it because community colleges are open admissions. They don't have academic standards. And that's not true because when you get on campus, you have to take placement exams and so forth, and many students are being funneled into college remediation. Um, students also are playing games with their GPA and thinking maybe it's better for me to take those easier courses so I can get the higher GPA and get into college, but research is showing that it's not just the GPA, but it's also rigorous courses, actually knowing how to do things that's going to matter when you get to college. So there are all these misperceptions about what students really need to do. And so the Bridge Project concludes, first of all, student knowledge about the curricular requirements is very sporadic and vague. They're unaware of the content of what colleges require of them. And the distribution of this information to students is also very inequitable depending on the school. In fact, they quote um, a high school English teacher who says, I would love to sit down and talk with or get reports from college professors on what they're expecting in their English programs for different groups of students. There just isn't even a conversation between college professors and high school teachers to help make this bridge much more manageable. And even in Massachusetts, when we were discussing should we have MCAS, what should it look like, and so forth, you didn't see a lot of discussion from the higher education um, community saying, oh, this is what we would like students to do when they receive when they get to college. So this general disconnect between what colleges are requiring and what high schools um, are requiring of their students are the signals that states are sending to students about what is enough. So if we turn and, and start to think about the pipeline, 
Uh, and Melissa showed a little bit of the pipeline of what's happening in Chicago. I'm going to show the pipeline for Massachusetts instead, again using this. If we start with 100 students in ninth grade, what happens to them? Well, first of all, let me say Massachusetts, this is kind of the best case scenario. Massachusetts actually does pretty well in rel relative to the nation, but I certainly don't think that our numbers are anything to be proud of. So for 100 ninth grade students, 76 are going to graduate from high school in four years, and 52 will enter college immediately. Another 40 will still be enrolled their second year, but only 29 are going to make it to a college degree, and that's an associate's degree within three years or a bachelor's degree within six years. Only 29%. 70% were losing somewhere along the way, and this is the best case scenario for the nation. Okay, certainly, again, I don't think anything to pat ourselves on the back um, about. Let me show some other data for another state. Uh, this is from Ohio. I've been doing some work with the state of Ohio, and I have a database that has everyone in the public higher education system, and I'm tracking them over time. So this is for the fall 1998 co cohort. Um, tracking them after six years, looking just at the f those who enter four-year institutions. And so what we can see there in the red box, I'm using some of the nice boxes that your, your co-authors put in your slides. Um, so they entered fall 1998. By spring, this is not even making it by the, their entire freshman year, 11% are gone. By the following fall, another 14% are gone. If you look four years later, by that time, 29% of the students are gone. And these are just students who are starting at four-year institutions, four-year public institutions. Within four years, 22% are completing that degree. Um, and I made a joke in my class earlier today, is a four-year degree, should we really even be calling it a four-year degree if people aren't completing it in four years? The standard that everyone's using now is six years, and so at these four-year institutions, about half are completing the bachelor's degree. 38% have completely dropped out, and then there are some others um, that are still kind of around the system. Um, again, let me note, this is a system-wide database, so if someone transfers to another institution, we still see them. If someone drops out or stops out for a while, shows up at another institution across the state, I'm still picking them up. So I may, be picking, I may be losing a few students if they're moving out of state, which is not typical for, for Ohio, but this really seems to capture what at least is going on in the four-year system and is very representative of what we're seeing nationally. Now, what about the community college system? So I, I've highlighted that top line, and I've broken this down by because we know that students at community colleges have different intents. Some actually want to transfer and get a four-year degree. The first two... Uh, Columns show this, university branch campuses and those who signify an intent to transfer. Others just want a two-year degree or just to get a certificate. But you can see after six years, I'm, I'm not even giving them just three years, I'm giving them six years to complete or transfer to a four-year institution, 55 to 78 percent of them are leaving the institution without any kind of degree, not showing up any time later to get anything. Um, if you look at the blue boxes, you can see about 27% are eventually transferring, getting that four-year degree, um, or completing other certificates or associate's degrees. But the, the, the fact is, when we've now actually started to get data about what's happening in colleges, we realize it's not just getting students into colleges, but it's getting them all the way out. And even with generous def definitions in terms of, uh, of looking at outcomes, we're losing a great number of students. So, what's the solution? Um, while Melissa focused on what's going on in high schools, I'm going to talk just briefly about what our college is doing. Um, thinking about remediation. First of all, you should be aware that somewhere from 35 to 40 percent of first-year students are being placed in remediation. Uh, community colleges, the majority of first-year students are being placed. And so while we're focusing today on these underprepared students who are coming directly from high school or, or within two years of, of graduating from high school, you also have a number of adults who are seeking developmental courses. Um, they may be people who dropped out of high school coming back to get a GED and then continue their education. They may be people, and this is particularly the case in Ohio, Ohio, who worked in a particular manufacturing industry which has now completely closed its doors and they're only in their 30s or 40s and need to retool to find some other kind of profession. Um, as Melissa said, uh, 
you need to realize that Harvard is off the charts selective. Most people uh, do not attend selective institutions. 80% of four-year students are entering schools that are pretty much open admissions, meaning they may require you to take the SAT or ACT, but they're pretty much accepting 90 to 95% of students. So that's 80% of students who are in four-year institutions, and basically everyone who's in the community colleges. And so this placement exam, the remedial placement exam that you have to take your first week you show up at, at college, is really the gatekeeper deciding who's just at a college versus who's actually in college level courses. Um, and so this, this remediation exam is what's really pushing students back. Uh, so just some basic facts, and again, I'm going to focus a bit on Ohio, but a lot of what Ohio does is also true nationally. First of all, there are statewide standards in, in most states to distinguish between what is actually high school level material versus college level material. But imagine trying to write this policy. You know, how would you describe what is a college competence? You know, what's college competency versus high school competency? And at least in Ohio, they allow the institutions to interpret these standards however they see, they see fit. Um, institutions in Ohio also use a combination of placement exams, ACT, SAT scores, high school transcripts. This also varies. Um, but the key thing with remediation is most schools, if you are placed in remediation, number one, you're required to take the courses, and you may be restricted from taking any other college courses until you get that remediation done. And so I think this is kind of foreshadowing why students who don't have adequate uh, um, academic preparation aren't, aren't graduating. If they have to get, take care of all these remediation classes, it's going to delay when they can start taking classes for their major. It has implications for switching majors and things like that. Um, some general information about remediation in Ohio. Um, actually, let's focus on the bottom part here by race. If you, if, uh, among the black students, 60% of them are placed in remediation. So the majority of black students who have four-year degree intent in Ohio are being placed in remediation. And the number is 47% uh, of Hispanic students. That's in comparison to only, not only, and again, I, these numbers is nothing to be proud of, but about a third of white students are being placed into remediation. So you're definitely seeing differences by race, small differences by gender, and if we were to map this on income, or type of high school that you are attending, we would see um, what you would expect. So this is this is everyone who's going to be at a four-year institution, as well as anyone at a community college who said I wanted to get a four-year degree, and that's only about a third of community college students. So only a third of the community college students are saying I'm here because I want to transfer to a four-year institution. It's not you know we think we're capturing accurately what people really want to do. In terms of preparation, no big surprise. Um, if you look at those who are being placed in, remediation, in math remediation versus those who are not, you can see the differences in scores, the differences in high school GPAs, and similarly in the blue boxes um, for, who are placed in English remediation, their ACT uh, English and reading scores, and their high school GPAs in English. So there's a huge de growing debate about remediation because proponents are saying we need to have opportunities for these underprepared students, um, but the critics are saying we're not giving incentives for high school students to work hard. Um, states and taxpayers are saying why do we have to pay for this a second time? And the question is, well, does remediation work? We're in a situation where we're very far from the ideal, and what are the solutions to deal with the fact that we have all of these students who aren't adequately prepared? Um, if you were just to compare the outcomes of students who are in remediation versus those who are not, I can already tell you what you're going to find, and I don't think this is surprising. Those who aren't placed in remediation, about 65% of them get, graduate with a four-year degree or a bachelor's degree in six years. Um, on the other side of the scale, if you're both in math and English remediation, you can see the percentage of students completing much lower. This is very similar to if we were to scale this based on academic preparation. And you can see the high rates of dropping out if you're placed in any kind of remediation. But keep in mind, this is like comparing apples to oranges. Of course, students who are in remediation are likely to not do as well because they have less academic preparation. All kinds of studies from Cliff Edelman on, on down the line have told us preparation matters. So what I've been trying to do... Um, with a co-author of mine who's at Case Western Reserve University, Eric Bettinger, is ask 
how do the outcomes of four-year students who are in remediation compare to similar students? Trying to get to this apples-to-apples -apples comparison um, of students who have similar backgrounds, similar preparation, but for whatever reason are not being placed in remediation. And looking at the time, I'm going to have to go a little bit faster here. Um, why don't I actually jump to what the conclusions of our study say? We find that if you can get to that apples to apples comparison, the students in remediation seem to have better outcomes. They seem to be more likely to persist, more likely to graduate within six years, more likely or less likely to transfer down to a less selective college. And so this is just the first in a series of studies that I know are coming out from ourselves and from other people who are researching this issue to see whether or not remediation makes a difference. There are certainly other questions we need answers, like what is the best way to offer remediation? Um, what about students that ha need years of remediation rather than just a course or two? And there's a big debate about what, state, what policy states should follow. Should it only be at the community colleges? Should it be at the community colleges and four institutions? Uh, and so on. So one last thing I do want to point out, there are some other things that states are doing, and Melissa already mentioned something that Illinois is doing, and that is giving the placement exam to students earlier. So that might be 10th or 11th grade, you take the actual placement exam you would take in college, and it gives you some feedback on what courses you should take in high school so you can avoid remediation. Uh, and here are some examples, Illinois is up there, also Oklahoma, Ohio, California, uh, Illinois is, is unusual in that it requires all students in 11th grade to do this. Ohio has been doing this since the late 70s, although they do it on a more voluntary basis, a school volunteers to be part of this. And it actually started from the Ohio State Math Department going to the high schools and saying, we want to help with this because we see this as such a big problem. Now, two last slides. Will preparation solve all problems in terms of college access and success? No. Um, I do want to remind, and for many of you who know my research, I do a lot of work on financial aid, and unmet financial needs seems to still have an impact on college qualified low income students. So, again, just looking at the low income students who have the GPAs, who have the right coursework, what happens to them? We find these differences in the percentage that are taking the appropriate exams, enrolling in a four year college, and completing that degree based on how much financial need uh, they have. So, financial aid also plays a role. Other things that also play a role, and I'm borrowing from Chris Avery's work and Tom Kane's work, looking at a college access program here in the Boston area, when they surveyed students to see, have you done all these different steps, taking the PSAT, registering for the SAT, actually taking the SAT after you register, meeting with a guidance counselor, visiting a college, having the application, and applying to college, there are also all these other steps that are required, especially if you want to get into a four-year institution, particularly a selective, even a moderately selective four-year your institution. And so knowing when to go through those hoops, even if you do have the preparation necessary, is another thing that we have to keep in mind. And I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, the microphones are open. Question for Melissa. You indicated that the greatest predictor of dropouts from high school was uh, poor skills. My question is, I'm sorry, did I misunderstand? Go ahead. I'm listening. Uh, okay. Um, would you comment on the recently released national study that suggested that high school dropouts said their number one reason for leaving was boredom? Mm, I think it's, I didn't say it was low skills, I said it was failing courses. Sorry. Um, and so, well, their the number of reason for dropping out is boredom. This was a very small study uh, in a selective sample. So, I, I see um, boredom, I, I just don't see kids saying, oh, I hate this place, I'm leaving. Um, I'd love, I mean, I, I really see much more of kids um, failing significantly and staying in. Over 40% of dropouts in Chicago are staying into school to 18, even though they have very few credits. Uh, there's very little options in the labor market, and so I, I don't see a lot of kids walking around saying, 
you know, I'm bored, I want to go get a job. Uh, in fact, we've just gotten the employment data and the, um, the employment outcomes of students who um, did not even go, graduate and go to college is are pretty abysmal. So I think it maybe this is a, a, a labor market that has very much dried up uh, for many kids. Now, does that mean that our high school classes are um, boring? Yes, they're abysmally boring. Um, they're horrible, and I think that contributes to low GPAs. I think that the low GPA is largely a measure of instructional quality. Thank you. The other thing is you, um, you get those big differences even within achievement quartile of whether kids are on track at the end of ninth grade or not. So you kids with the same test scores, some of whom pass their courses and stay on track, some of whom don't. Mm -hmm. And the difference may be that the ones who don't engage were bored, yeah. and that's why they weren't on track yeah. at the end of the ninth grade. And so, what I, yes, what I really I, wonder I, about it. I think it, bad classroom instruction is a major reason for, um, is a significant contributor to both failure and dropout. I don't think, I, you know, again, this is a, I, I've spent almost all my time in Chicago and Massachusetts. Um, I think one of the things that has changed is when I was in Massachusetts in the 80s, kids dropped out. They said, I want to go and go get jobs. And I almost never hear this now. Uh, particularly, I mean, this is really important because there's this sort of Latino um, belief that kids are leaving high schools. Latinos in CPS, we're not seeing any difference in, a, in aspirations, nor are we seeing any difference in the percentage of kids who say that their parents want them to go to college. Um, so I, I, I do think that the answer has to be really engaging kids deeply in the, in the, in, in the work yes. for both GPAs. That's what I'm really asking, if I could take another minute. You talk about high school reform, but we really haven't had a chance to explore what that means. I've done a lot of focus groups with kids all over the country, high school kids, for a number of years. And when I ask them what's the one thing that would make the greatest difference for their learning, they, over and over again, the two answers are having teachers who know me and respect me and having more opportunities for hands-on challenging work. and interesting work. So I just was wondering if you would comment more on what you mean by high school reform, perhaps. What do I mean by high school reform? Um, uh, well, first, uh, I, mean, I think we're talking about three levels of high school reform. I think, first of all, we're, taking, we're, we're talking about real structural reforms in ninth grade, as well as curricular reforms in ninth grade, so that we make sure that kids get on track right away and that pay attention to freshmen. We have run ninth grade as the sorting year for many, many years. Um, and that was perfectly fine when 54% dropout rates could get kids jobs. It is no longer fine. Uh, so we're seeing, once these kids have the same sorting effect, they stay around at high school for a very long time, even though they're not con uh, So one level of high school reform is, is an entire set of structural and conditional reforms to make sure that pretty much uh, I'm using the ninth grade success academy model as one approach. Um, I'm working in another high school right now which has unbelievably successful on-track rates using a combination of the block schedule and keeping the kids together, uh, using AVID very successfully for those kids. They're actually school-wide AVID. Um, and, and really paying attention to the ninth grades and getting them in. That's one thing. Then we've got to ratchet up. We've got to make um, courses very significant and really engaging for kids. And, and I largely think that's about um, challenging instruction in significant ways. Now, in urban areas, um, we've seen, uh, I'm running a study now where we, we're sitting in a lot of AP and IB classrooms. And I think AP offers a structure for teachers in urban areas that they're, they're grasping onto um, sort of as a mission from God. You know, you sit down with the AP teachers and they say, ah, oh, my job is to give what the kids in the suburban areas get. I think AP in suburban uh, systems is largely a test prep philosophy. Uh, so it's working a little bit different in urban areas, but I think getting teachers to work together on curriculum uh, and ensuring that we're really focused on high levels of engagement, course performance, and the non-cognitive skills, study skills, writing, um, things that kids are really going to need for college. Um, we've gone for, to a college level curriculum and, and CPS a long time ago, so uh, we've, all of the work that you've seen here is when most of these college reforms uh, have already happened. So I, I think just dema demanding more coursework is a really important thing. The third thing I think we need to do, and I think it is significant, is we've got to be ratcheting kids up all the way through, and we have to reform 12th grade. Um, I think we do have one model for high-performing kids, which is the 
sort of more advanced transitional coursework. For um, kids that are going into selective and non-selective colleges, I don't think that giving placement exams is the right way to go. I think we should pre-certify. I think we should say to these kids in 12th grade, well, if you want to go to a, a state college in which you may face a remedial exam, let's take it at the beginning of the year and let's do an applied math, writing, and, and English course all the way through, pass the test in 12th grade so you walk out of here with zero probability that you're going to have to take one of these placement exams. Uh, because I okay. think largely... Um, my whole staff is enrolling in the community colleges in the fall. It should be a lot of fun. But when I see this, you know, let's be serious. We see these high placement rates, right? So if you and I go take our driver's test right now, and we don't get, grab that little stupid book and look at the rules before we take the test, how many people here are going to pass your driver's test? Do you know what, what the conditions under which people are taking these remedial exams? In the community college, it's a compass-based test that's a computer-based test that these kids have never taken in their life. They don't know they're going to take it. That's what yep. Bridget just told you. They don't have no idea they're going to take it. They show up. There's a big of computers. It's like getting on the American Airlines self-booking system that they're going to take these tests on. And they're, right, they've never, never studied for this. And what's important is, especially even if you came on a pre-calculus, it always begins at very, very basic math. So these kids haven't had any refresh of courses at all in this stuff. And on the compass test, if you don't get the basic stuff, it doesn't let you go to the big, to the more advanced stuff. So you've set these kids up from failure from, from number one. So to say that these kids are not ready, I would not use these remedial placement tests as any indication of that. I would say if you create testing under chaotic circumstances in which the person taking the test has absolutely no probability, understanding of what they're doing, you've pretty much set yourself up for the placement exams we've seen. Um, now, I'm, I'm so happy that Bridget's telling me that we're not killing kids by doing that chaos. Um, we are making them default on loans, however, and that's particularly important. So I do think that, they, that what I'm saying about high school reform is I want to get up high school reform that says small schools curriculum, things like that, and say, we've got to work on very particular problems and make sure that we've got high school reform working on particular problems. The last thing on 12th grade, and I, I, want, to, I want to emphasize, uh, put three exclamation, exclamation points on what Bridget said. The college application process, particularly for our higher performing kids, is one of the most overwhelming experiences I've ever seen. I had one of my really kids with, who has a great sense of humor come in, and, and she's at 4.0, um, AP on it, IB kid. She is an exceptional person. She started the application process with this wide ray. She has a mother who will do anything for this kid, but who hasn't gone to college, so she's basically sitting at home going. <laughs> right? Okay. She came in, she said, Oh, these application essays. Duke, if you could be any color, what color would you be? She says, well, I'm black, so that's not good. I know white is the wrong answer. So do you think I look pink? Now, then she read me four others. These are bizarre, right? And this is a kid with nobody helping her fill this out. So what a surprise. So then I was sitting down with this kid. And at one point, she has a great sense of humor, and I have a good relationship with her. So in the middle of an interview, I said, so who's helping you with this? She said, well, no one. I'm just trying to figure out how to do this on the weekends. And I said, well, who's asked you where you're applying? She said, no one, why? I said, wait a minute, let me just get this straight. Are you telling me, it's one of the top kids in the school, that nobody, not a principal, not a teacher, not a guidance counselor, not the lunchroom supervisor, and not a security guard had asked you where you're going to college next year? And she said, well, technically, no, you have. Now, I want to talk about personalization because... On fire drills at these high schools, when I'm randomly standing at fire drills and standing next to kids, what question do you ask when you get introduced to a 12th grader? Hi, I'm da da da. Oh, where are you going to college next year? This means that she's not having any conversations with any adults in this building during her 12th grade year. It's not even bad that no one has asked her or is helping her. It literally means that she probably hasn't been hanging on and having a conversation with any adult in the building. Because after that interview, I ended up not even realizing it, asking three kids because I was standing around on a fire alarm in the dead of winter, very cold, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and asking kids. So I think what, what I'm trying to argue is high school reform is not about a particular strategy. It is about taking seriously all of the particular tasks we have to put together. And if I could just continue with that just briefly, I gave some results for remediation, and this is still a wide open debate. So I don't necessarily want to 
first say credit, at least we're not hurting them. Because if you remember from an earlier slide, even those in remediation, only about one third are graduating. There are just a lot of un, there's a lot of unknowns right now. And the placement exam, for for all intents and purposes, is a high stakes exam that no one is talking about. And it certainly is under the conditions that Melissa just described. Now, different states are using early placement testing in different ways, and I don't actually know that Illinois is doing it necessarily the right way. Other states like Ohio, if you pass it in 10th grade, then you're done. It's not something that you then have to worry about two, three, four, or think if you're a non-traditional student returning back to college at the age of 23, trying to remember some class you took, you know, in 10th grade. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of debate, there's a lot of unanswered questions, and when I tried to find out whether or not these early placement tests are actually working, um, giving information to students so they can make better choices and become prepared, we don't know the answer right now, which is why I'm starting some work in that area. Yes. Hi. Um, my question is around um, this idea of retention. I work at a high school, public high school, where the majority of our students are coming from either low-income households and uh, first-generation backgrounds. So we continue to do a lot of work with them uh, upon graduation to stay connected with them around some of the issues that they're dealing with when they're in college. So for the data that we've seen, which I think was very thorough and, and, and uh, thought-provoking and obviously abysmal, as you said, around ideas of, uh, of uh, course preparation, what about issues of uh, acculturation? Because one of the things that we're seeing and talking to kids about is that in our school we don't have grades either, so we can't say GPA and look at that whole angle. But what we can do is talk to the students. What we found is that there are a lot of issues, particularly for kids who are coming from backgrounds where their parents have no clue about college and what it even means to go on to get a college education and why you're getting a college education. So I, I wonder if you could speak to perhaps the idea of what kids are dealing with on a personal level and a social level when they step into a world that is completely unfamiliar to them. Can I intervene for just a second? Um, this is officially supposed to be over at 7. I'm going to try to keep them from kicking us out of here until 10 after 7, but we need to try to stay on pace for, for 10 after 7 to be done. Um, I think that, uh, well, first of all, when we say GPA, I'm using GPA as an indicator of are you studying are you working hard? One of the charters in Chicago, Young Women's Leadership Charter, also doesn't do grades. Um, however, they really focus on getting these kids to, to take every assignment and meet benchmarks, and it has an enormous impact on their study skills. We looked at the one-year retention numbers for those guys, and they're, they're very, very good. Um, I think this is a very significant issue. It's why I really worry about college choice for kids and how we get um, kids prepared for this and move forward. For me, most first-generation parent students and for most of the kids that I study, college is an outcome. It's not an experience, right? It's a credential. Um, and, and there's two problems with that. Then college is college is college is college, and all colleges are alike as long as it's college, right? And so moving them to really think about what they want out of college and how to choose that, that's an important choice. Um, the other issue is then really thinking and working with them in high school about the skills they need for college. At North Lawndale College Prep, our goal is to send all of our kids to college. We also follow, we have a fourth or fifth year counselor who follows kids into college. And a lot of what we're doing in junior, senior year is getting that acculturization. Get them on college campuses, get them away for the summer. Um, we try to get all the kids away at least for one summer because then they get the experience of, li of moving home, of moving out of home. Um, the more we do of that in high school, I think it really pays off. Mm -hmm. And all those things definitely matter in college. There's some things I didn't talk about, such as summer bridge programs, where one goal is to give students study skills and perhaps remediation during the summer, but it's also to build their confidence about what it's like to be on the campus, where are the resources, and also build a cohort of other people who will support them as they go through. I mean, that's just listing one of many possible things. The, but one great thing with the way the research is going is colleges are not black boxes. There's not just you're a four-year selective and you are this or that. Colleges have programs, policies, and people that can make a difference. And so trying to figure out which policies, programs, tutoring centers, you know, go all the way down the list. Because if you look at any of these categories of colleges and new data is coming out, they'll have huge differences in what their graduation rates are going to be, particularly by race and by gender. So trying to identify what's working and what's not is, you know, a way that a lot of people are thinking right now. And making sure that you're sending to kids to colleges that are doing right by them. 
Okay. You can um, slightly up here, standing. Okay. Um, my name is Mary White Berkeley. Um, I came from, uh, just came from Japan, and uh, I was a teacher uh, in Japan for 10 years, but I'm sorry for my English, and I tried to express. <laughs> And uh, um, I... Um, Is it better I, than mine? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I today learned that uh, um, Georgia teachers uh, um, asked the um, college professors that what the um, college expects uh, from students. And uh, I think uh, um, high school teachers should know this kind of thing, but uh, the, um, they don't quality, you know, high school teachers' quality uh, should be raised, but uh, um, funds from government, um, I don't think it is possible to um, make a good quality from uh, high school teachers. But so um, if uh, it is possible, um, training for um, high school teachers are uh, necessary, but when we cannot do we cannot do that, um, like uh, Latino students or um, Af African American students. Um, I think this is uh, not that uh, these people uh, cannot study. Um, they have uh, um, ability, but uh, I think there are uh, problems with uh, um, ethical problem. Um, think, um, there is something that they cannot do um, best uh, um, to study. So I think uh, there. There is um, education is necessary to inspire. Um, Could you turn the microphone toward oh, your yes. mouth? I'm yeah. sorry. Because we're actually actually recording this, and you know. Uh, sorry, you can hold. <laughs> it rolled out to the next row. Sorry, it's under the first. Okay. You can hold it in your hand, actually, and speak into it. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. I'm sorry, and uh, I think. Uh, um, I, I thought uh, um, American people can do best when um, they think that uh, this is a good thing, I'm doing the good thing. So if uh, students know that uh, um, they, they study, it is good for community and uh, good for society. And uh, um, if uh, all teachers uh, um, become passionate and uh, um, passionate about uh, um, making uh, um, higher uh, intelligence about uh, to uh, individual students. I think uh, students become uh, passionate also. And uh, um, I came to um, compare to 20 years ago, um, say here at Harvard, um, I came uh, summer school at that time, but uh, at that time... Uh, Can I interrupt? Um, we, have to, we only have a couple uh, more minutes. Uh, I just want to make very sure. Sorry. Um, um, students were um, debating about the piece of the world or like uh, um, topic of uh, um, or origin of articles. So uh, about in lunch time, but uh, now uh, I, don't, I heard that they are not doing only a school, a Kennedy School of Government. And uh, so I think uh, um, maybe graduate uh, graduate schools um, will. Uh, um, Do you have a question? Take, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, like uh, curriculum for um, ethics about uh, how to teach, uh, not the skills, but the uh, um, character education. Character education. Okay. And, uh, Yes. Okay. I, I'm sorry that I cannot. Uh, no, that's fine. You did well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, the only thing that I want to say is, is we, we talked about K-16 alignment and talking to high college teachers about what they expect. Uh, I think we really have. I mean, sending well-prepared students into college and making sure they're making college good college choices is correct. Uh, the higher education institutions need to get real. Uh, in Chicago State, 16% of kids graduate within six years. In Northeastern, 11% graduate within six years. Um, if I look at the kids with comparable background who go to different colleges, they have graduation rates three to four times that, particularly for our best prepared students. Now, what does that say to you? 
It tells me that the last person I want to ask is someone who's producing that kind of poor academic performance for their kids. I would never go to the lowest performing high school in the city and ask, what do you kids need to do well here? And I, and I, I feel like we, we've got to be very careful about demanding high quality from the local public institutions. The highest retention rates we're seeing in Chicago are from some of the proprietary schools who got told a while back, you don't get your retention rates up, you don't get federal money. Remarkably, Robert Morris produces the most amazing retention rates in the first year because you walk in that door and there's academic plans and there's cohorts and there's, and there's all kinds of supports for kids all the way through to make sure that nobody defaults on their student loans so that they can stay in business. None of this occurs in the local state universities in Chicago. And so I really think that we have got to not only demand more of high schools, but we've got to be very serious that one of the ways that we can increase retention rates is simply to say to colleges, the factory model of college performance is unacceptable in this age. And, and, and these, these retention rates have got to be paid attention to, and the quality of your classes have got to be paid attention to. We, we've, we're running college classrooms in Chicago of 400 kids. How am I going to prepare a kid for doing that? I can't prepare a kid to sit in front of 400 people. How are they going to learn in that environment? And what a surprise that they're going to do poorly there. So I can focus on making sure that they're prepared moving in, but I've also got to make sure that they are walking in to high quality environments. And that's from my high school principal. You know, the high schools are used to accountability at this point, so they have no problem with accountability. I said accountability to my provost, and I thought he was going to fall off the chair. So that is definitely the case, and I do not disagree at all about what colleges need to do in looking at their own performance. So one thing, though, that worries me a great deal as we continue to look forward is if you look at the state appropriations going to these institutions and how much money they have to spend on students, and think about our most recent recession, the appropriations have been cut. And so how are they going to make up that money? They're going to switch to part-time faculty members, instructors, who are not going to be as engaged at the institution and able to meet with students. They're going to build class size up to 400 students. And then the legislators wonder, oh, why aren't you providing qualities? Too bad we cut your budget 15% in one year. You know, this all goes around and around and around, and it's a catch-22. But the one thing that colleges can't do, and I had a discussion earlier with students about standards, are we expecting too much of students when they get to college, is the labor market is going to be there, and the labor market is not forgiving. And regardless of what we do, China and India and everyone else is going to come up and have all kinds of skills, and we still have to require what we need in order to have, make sure students are, are uh, functional in the labor market, and that's growing over time. Um, so we're kind of all caught in this, in this catch-22, but it all cycles and it's all interconnected. Hey, uh, um, is this on? Yep, it's on. You're good. Yeah. Uh, Bill Why don't McCur you pick it up if you want? I don't think I've ever done a presentation with a man in a sound booth. I feel really cool here. <laughs> Um, I, I'll, I'll be quick, but for both Melissa and Bridget, I've been lucky enough to work a lot on reform in Chicago and in Ohio. And so in many ways, this is a bit of a kick in the gut in the sense of the data. So the question to you two, because it's fabulous data, it's very powerful, but for all of those who've been working on reform for so long in Chicago and Ohio, as you present your data as scholars, what are you doing to keep people engaged, not going, oh my goodness, because these are very reform-weary, if not sophisticated, locations. I had a really bad week on this issue. We released a report and we spent three hours with all the high school principals carefully walking through all of the things. And my message was like grades, 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 grades of college choice. So you could imagine what the headline was. They didn't pick up grades. They picked up my 2.5 percent number and the headline of the Tribune was, oh I don't even, half page of the Tribune with that number and the Sun Times was appalling. Uh, and I, I, and I, I mean, I feel like the high school principals feel like we did a bait and switch on them, but, but I think the issue is how to use this data not to appall, but to sort of say it's a new day. And I think the good news is, is it is a new day. I mean, I think we've been very clear. This is an entirely new expectations. When I brought Ron to Chicago, I said, isn't this fantastic? Because when I first came to Chicago Public Schools, all I cared about was the dropout rate, right? And I remember him working on the Minority Achievement Gap Networks, thinking to myself, oh yeah, that's like what I wish I was worried about, whether black kids wanted to take AP courses. <laughs> well, we're here. 
I'm worrying about the Chicago Public Schools, worrying about whether black kids are taking AP classes. Isn't that a major accomplishment? Um, I think that what, what we've seen is a really dramatic transformation in what kids are bringing, and, and, I, and a, particularly in high schools in Chicago, a real big dramatic transformation in what high schools are willing to step up and take on. Uh, and so I think the bad news is the best news we've got, because nobody, nobody would put this issue on the table 10 years ago. And you also didn't yeah. em emphasize that much the progress that the elementary schools have made. Right. They're at the point now where the eighth grade performance is at national norms. And that change happened over less than a decade. So there is hope. It's just got to take it on through the high schools now. But it's been really hard working it without trying to right. get the math. In terms of Ohio, I applaud them. Uh, because they were one of the first states in the late 90s to have a performance report and be honest about what's going on. I mean, part of the problem with a lot of this is we don't even know. I mean, we don't even know what's happening at most colleges in terms of persistence or the transition from 8th grade to 12th grade into college and so forth. And Ohio's been one of the rare states that have said, we're going to look at this and we're going to face fact that things aren't going well and then see if we can identify what works. And starting this remediation project, I had no idea what I was going to find. But I can say, you know, we go back continually to the Ohio Board of Regents. We invite them out here. There's an information exchange. And it's also discussion. The colleges need to talk to each other about what they're doing and what's working and what's not working and just be upfront about this because I think practitioners, most people who work in schools know that it's bad and they're afraid to admit that. But if you don't ever admit that and, and address the problem head on, no progress is made. Uh, as this gentleman comes to the mic, I'll point, there are reasons for hope nationally with regard to being able to narrow the achievement gap. Uh, we cut more than two-thirds, about two-thirds out of the reading score gap in the NAEP between 1970 and 1990. We cut about a third out of the math score gap over that period. There's new evidence of virtually no difference in mental ability at age one, which means there are things that happen af after age one that probably help to account for that. The IQ gap between blacks and whites is narrowed by between a fifth and a third between 1972 and 2002. So there's change happening. There is progress made on a number of fronts. And the point is when we deliver bad news, we deliver it with a sense of hope. And we just have to continue to promote that. Uh, last question. I will make my statement in 60 seconds or less. Um, speaking as a former boy, um, <laughs> yeah, I think you underestimate what I will do and can do if I am interested. And my problem is that I spend a lot of time in school and in college not very interested. Do I think I should go to college? Yes, I do. Do I want to go to college? Yes, I do. Do I want to learn in college? No, not particularly. Um, so we're going to push a lot of kids, boys like me and others, to college. But we're, you're never going to engage me uh, yet. Hopefully you will someday. And the other, so I think we need to do a lot more to, to interest kids in college. Until that happens, not much is to interest them in college work. That's it. Learning in college as opposed to just the idea of going to college. Right. Because everybody agrees now that we should go to college, and, and yeah, it's the right thing to do. The other piece is that, you know, I sense that with either 4,000 or 9,000 colleges in this country, there are a lot of colleges that would be very exciting for me if you would help me find them. And, there, and that's the, the wealth and the richness of the American higher education system is there's so many different weird colleges that uh, are just great for me if you'll help me find them. Final comment? I'll just briefly say what you're talking about is information. The lack of information, that there's a wide world out there and that there are schools out there that might appeal to your interests or, your, you know, the extra preparation you need or things like that. that. This is more than just about preparation. It's about information in all types and forms. And, you know, I think it's hard to figure out how to make kids excited about staying up all night doing problem sets. But let's be honest, what's the alternative? Do you really understand what it's like to be relegated to having to work a minimum wage job for the rest of your life? You know, I know personally my sister was not excited about college until she had to work a minimum wage job and figured out this is what life would be like if I don't go. Um, the alternative is so bad, uh, it's easier to make that case than to say, yes, it's going to be exciting to do, you know, uh, calculus problem sets at 3 o'clock in the morning when you see no use for this information. Thanks. I've got one thing to say, I mean, I, and I, I think I disagree with you. I think we've got to be really, really careful on the boy issue. 
Um, I remember there was one point in my life where I decided that I was leaving the feminist movement. <laughs> it was during the gender debates around math where I actually sat through an academic presentation where somebody said, girls don't do well on standardized tests because we're morally more complex. <laughs> And we can't just make these kinds of decisions. And I actually sat next to somebody on the plane yesterday who's working on the law exam who gave me the same response that girls are doing, women are doing worse on these LSATs because we have more, we see more nuances in the war and that's what makes us. And I was sitting in a conversation listening to, I think it was National Public Radio, but it may have not. And when I get really depressed, I listen to the Comedy Central channel. Um, where the discussion was that boys do poorly on standardized tests because with all that testosterone, they have so hard time paying attention. And I thought, these are crazy. This is crazy. I mean, girls are more morally more complex, and boys, I don't know about testosterone, but um, up until now, testosterone's been working fine for them, right? Somebody, somebody messed around with the testosterone. So I think we've got to be really, really clear on boys. Now, I lucked out on my study. God works in mysterious ways and got me probably one of the best English departments I've ever seen in my life. And that English department has pushed me on the boy issue more than anything because they are remarkable. And they don't, I honestly think that some of the women in the, some of the, the women and the men in this department, if I actually stopped and asked them what color or gender the kids were in their class, they don't even notice it when they're teaching. But they have these kids so engaged, it is remarkable. And what I've learned in my last class is that I discriminate against boys. I was in this class a couple weeks ago where this guy was sitting and they were working intensely on writing. I told Ron the story this afternoon. This is a 12th grade double block period humanities class in which you have to compete. This is for regular high school students. You have to compete to get into this class, sign an agreement that you will do the homework. It is 50-50 boys and girls. And they were working in pairs on writing. And this one kid was sitting there, young Latino man. And I had just gone through my observations and mocked him unengaged. And this teacher walked up and said to the kids, this typical writing exercise prompt. So, Jose, what was it like hearing your, write, your, your paper read to you? I have been working on my length of my sentences all year long, and I can't, I can't even follow her reading it to me. My sentences are still too long. Now, I had marked him unengaged. But he was so engaged that he had this blank look on his face. And I started noticing how many classes, if you really think about it, I can't tell in the good classes whether the boys are engaged or not. But if the teachers call on them, which good teachers do, you find out they're very engaged. The same, in the same group of students last year, there was an AP class that was so good that at one point kids were making literary references all over the place, and they had no problem engaging in that. In fact, they were talking about a very female play, as one boy said in the middle of the thing. This is a very feminist play. Now, I, I, I just think that we just assume that boys don't like school is making wild assumptions about what boys will do. I do know that if my theory of most of the education I've seen, if I had to impose a theory, it's that if you teach boys that education is mostly irrelevant, stupid, and dumb, they won't be engaged. And most of the education I've seen in high school, the theory of action is the best way to prepare for kids for college is to give them completely irrelevant, stupid, and dumb material on a regular basis. Now, maybe girls are better at being compliant on stupid and dumb material than boys are. Maybe I'll go there. But I don't think that boys are less intellectuals than girls, at least according to the demographics of the Harvard and University of Chicago faculty. Just real quick about the gender gap, because I think this is a large issue that's starting to get a lot of press. A couple of things to keep in mind. The gender gap in terms of African Americans didn't just flip. It flipped in the late 70s. Yes. And for Latinos, it flipped in the 80s. And it's only now starting to get, or actually it was, I think, in the late 80s, early 90s that it flipped for amongst the white population. So this has been around for a while. In what measure? On what dimension? And if you look at pretty much anything, 
high school graduation, entry into college, if you have any kind of data on achievement and so forth about the girls passing the boys. This has been going on for 30 years now and we're just now starting to pay attention to it. I think part of the reason why it's so problematic now is the world is less forgiving. It's one strike and you're out. If you do things roughhousing, if you are you know, presenting yourself, you're doing what typical guys do, the way that they dress, the way that they hang out, regardless of what's going on in their head, teachers don't respond to that very well. We now have you know, you have a strike against you, you're suspended. That's the way that, you know, lots of high schools and schools have been reforming themselves. So this has been going on for a while, but now you can't drop out of high school or just get a high school degree and get a good job in manufacturing. There's no place for you in the economy. It's much more detrimental. And so these high stakes, along with patterns that have been longer, going on for a very long time, um, are catching up with us. Now, does that mean that boys can't be engaged? Absolutely not. But I think we, again, have to confront what we're doing. And I, I think your example was, was wonderful and just how, even as teachers, professors, we perceive different kinds of students by what they're doing. Let me end by thanking Bridget and Melissa for their presentations and discussion this evening. I also want to ask you as the audience, um, we plan to do a number of forums with, with the Achievement Gap Initiative next year. And if you've got ideas on forums or panels or events you'd like to see hosted by the Achievement Gap Initiative, please do get in touch with me and give me those ideas. Also, uh, we're in the process of putting up a website that we plan to, we're trying to make it as useful as possible, not only to academics but to the public. If you've got things that you'd like to see on a website um, with a label such as the Achievement Gap Initiative, just let us know what, you, um, what your thoughts are. And let me uh, thank all of you for being here tonight and end with another applause for our speakers. <laughs>